Hello, I'm Mike Reeves, and today we're going to be looking at the very first words of the Bible, Genesis 1. Now, when a king or queen of England is crowned, just after they've taken their oath, they are given a Bible and told, Your Majesty, we present you with this Bible, the most precious thing that this world affords. And my aim today is for you to sense the truth of that. That here in the Bible we have the most precious and valuable thing that is in this world. Why? Well, let's have a look at the opening words of Genesis 1 for the sheer power and beauty of God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was was out form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. Okay, so all there is is without form, void, emptiness, blackness, nothingness. There is no life, no light, nothing but black emptiness. And then... Thank the Lord. God's golden voice is heard. Let there be light. And then his word proclaimed into the void shines radiant, good, life-giving light. And throughout Genesis 1, as God's word goes out, as he speaks, then life goodness and the very cosmos are brought into existence. Such is the power of the word of God. Before it, there simply is no life, no beauty, no potential for life, no light, nothing. But God speaks, and at his word, all these things come into being. And that's our experience as Christians too, that without the light of life, we were all dead in the darkness of sin. And then, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone his word into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Because we are God's work of new creation. And God creates through his word. Now, isn't that a different way of looking at things? You see, I think we tend to feel, well, we've already got life. And then here's the Bible, this rather dark and somber thing. And since we've already got life, all it can do is bring constriction and restraint to the life we already have. Actually, it's completely the other way round. God's word is a golden thing, the bringer of joy. It is the bringer of all life and light. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, God's word is compared to food, uh, or nourishing and tasty. So, uh, particularly, it's compared to honey. Psalm 19, the words of God, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. See, into our hungry weakness, the word of God is like this, a honeyed, life-giving feast. Now, when you get that, the word of God When you see that it is the world and life-creating power of God, it is so liberating. Let me just give you an example to show you why it's so liberating. Let me tell you um, about the great 16th century reformer Martin Luther. Now, looked at from the outside, Luther must have had one of the all-time most stressful lives ever. He got attacked, he got kidnapped, he was under a death sentence for most of his life. He got threatened with being burned alive. And all that time, he was turning Europe upside down, pumping out books, sermons, Bible translations. Did it get to him? No. Here's what Luther said about his life. He said, 
I simply taught God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, the word did everything. So we can relax, for the power is not with us. The power to turn the world upside down lies here in the word. We can simply hold it out. But when Luther did that, when he simply held out God's word, it did change the world forever. Of course, of course it would. Because the word of God is what brings new life into being. Nothing else, the word of God. And it is when the Bible is taught that lives are turned around. It is when the Bible is put in the driving seat, when the Bible is not simply admired and revered on a Sunday, it is when the Bible shapes every detail of how a church works, then expect great things. Then expect world-changing mission. Now, actually, there is something very key in Genesis 1 that we haven't noticed yet. Because do you remember what John says at the beginning of his gospel? John 1, verse 1. John writes, In the beginning was the Word. Well, this sounds familiar. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Do you see, John's doing a commentary on Genesis 1. The word through which God creates that shines into the darkness, but John calls the word him. Of course, the word he is talking about is Jesus, the word who became flesh. The universe-creating word isn't actually the Bible all by itself. It is Jesus. Now, none of that undoes anything of what we've been seeing so far, but it adds something hugely important. And that is this. We are not interested in just opening up the Bible for its own sake. No. The Bible is there to proclaim Jesus. And it is only when we use the Bible to make Jesus known that God's power to save and create life is wielded. You see, you could use the Bible to preach a very different message to the gospel of Jesus. You could, and people have, use the Bible to preach a message of moralism. You could, and have, people have used the Bible to preach all sorts of things. It's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. It's what the Mormons do. It's what a whole host of cults do. It's what um, the Jews do with the Old Testament. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus condemns the Jews in his day for doing. John 5.39 he says to the Jews in his day, you search the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And if we diligently search the scriptures, but don't let them woo us and drive us to Christ, if we don't see them bearing witness to Jesus, then we've fallen into exactly the problem Jesus was condemning in the Jews here that he was speaking to. For the Bible is, as the Apostle Paul put it, the word of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a word about him. Jesus is the Lord of Israel, the subject and heart of the whole Bible. And so... That's why when we open up the Bible, it must be to read about, get to know, and proclaim Jesus. It is given to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. So, opening up the Bible is not good enough. 
you must use the Bible as the Bible means you to use it. That is, to find, know, and then proclaim the gospel of Jesus. But when that does happen, then, when the Bible is allowed to speak for itself as a clear testimony to Jesus, then God's own life-creating voice rings out to change the world. Christians can't live on the thin gruel, the paltry diet of mere practical advice and moralism. If you feed Christians on that sort of diet, you will only rear Pharisees and distinctly off-putting religious weirdos. Think about it. The aim of the Bible, well, if it was simply to give handy lifestyle pointers for today, bluntly, it had never got accepted by the publishers. Because just look at it. You start off with page after page of ancient history. And just to add to the irrelevance, I don't, even, don't know how many chapters you've got devoted to genealogies. I mean, how is an Abraham bore a son Isaac supposed to be relevant to me today? Go and do likewise? What do I do with that? And then you've got material addressed to priests or kings, but not to us. And it's not as if the New Testament's much different. You'd read, say, the book of Acts, just a bunch of stories about the apostles. And never once does Luke turn to the reader and say, Oi, reader, go and do some evangelism. Nope, it's just another story about Paul. Now, did God get it wrong in putting the Bible together like that? No. Perhaps... Just perhaps, how the Bible is put together like that can teach us something. See, instinctively, we want to use Christ as just a bit of flavoring for our day. And so what I do is I try to rip out stuff from the Bible for me now. But the very nature of the gospel is about pulling my obsessive gaze away from my own navel so that I may stare up and look at Christ. And so, instead of giving us handy tips, moral lifestyle pointers for effective religious lives, the Bible tells us about Christ. What he's done, who, it is, who he is, what it's like to know him, to trust him. Now, if you get that, actually you'll have far more effective and relevant Bible reading. Because Bible reading, you'll find, is no longer obsessing about me. It's gazing in awe at the majesty of Christ. And as through the pages you get caught up in the wonder of his story, you know what will happen? You've not been looking for quick handy pointers, but as you look at that story, what you'll find is... Strangely, your heart will start pounding for him. You didn't expect it, but your heart's turned. In a way that it never would if you'd kept ripping it all down immediately to, so what does this mean for me right now? You learn of Christ, and your heart is one. Open your Bible, learn of Christ and see God's life-giving light shine into the darkness. Truly, this is the most valuable thing that this world affords.